Kia ora guys, I hope everyone's doing well. I am Chris Clancy, AP European History Lead Teacher here at Five Bowl. Today I am going to be streaming about Rococo art, um, which I like to call useless art, even though no art is useless, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, so hopefully you will get a lot out of this. Rococo art uh, is probably my most favorite art that we teach here in AP Euro because of how much it had an impact, not just on the French lifestyle, but also on French politics. And I am definitely a lover of all things political. Uh, so this evening, we're gonna go over Rococo art. We've got a lot to cover. Um, and so let's just jump right on in. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, it is very rainy here in New Zealand. Um, we were having some great weather and then all of a sudden, you would think there's a hurricane. Uh, but hopefully everybody can see that. So again, my name is Chris Clancy. I am the AP Euro uh, lead teacher here at Fiveable. Uh, I'm gonna be covering Rococo art. Uh, I was a teacher for AP European history in the United States, as well as AP world history and AP psychology. Uh, so I'm well versed in how this all works. I also was an AP reader, still am. Uh, and so hopefully I can give you guys some great tips on things. If you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask. I am here to help. Uh, make sure that you are following Fiveable on all of its social media, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, this is how we stay up to date with you guys, not just about our streams, but just about general goings on and things at Fiveable. Uh, we get our interesting articles, you know, we do some polls, things like that. That's a great way to stay in contact with us. Coming up, we have a lot coming up soon. Uh, so we did a period one Q&A earlier uh, in the week and I wanted to do another one. So we're gonna go ahead and do another period one Q&A. It's going to be Tuesday, October 22nd at 8 p.m. Uh, and then we are going to do the next day, the English Restoration and the Glorious Revolution, the second half of English constitutionalism on October 23rd at 8 p.m. That's gonna be hosted by Liam Macklin, uh, followed by me as a wrap up of the Absolutism Constitutionalism Unit uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then Friday, we've got the Enlightenment at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, hosted by Sherry Liang, and the Enlightened Absolutists following at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, hosted by Bella Blanton. So we've got a lot of things back to back. I hope that you can join us for all of them. These are some really big topics, especially uh, enlightenment and enlightened absolutists. We are setting the stage for Napoleon, We're setting the stage for the French Revolution and what I love to call the long century, which is the 1800s, because so much happens in the 1800s. And you won't be able to understand the 1800s if you don't understand the enlightenment and the effects of the enlightenment. So make sure that you join us. And then on Halloween, best day of the year for some people, we are going to be doing the new societal order, the 1700s European family. This is a really important topic because a lot of the times we tend to not talk about the everyday life of Europeans in this course. This is the chance where you can learn how do all of these big ideas, big topics, big events affect the everyday life of Europeans. Uh, and it gives you some great writing points for when you're doing your SAQs, your LAQ, or your DBQ. So make sure that you sign up for all of these, come join us, and I hope to see you there. So this stream, we got a lot going on, all right? So we're gonna intro Roco Rococo art, explain to you what it is, uh, go over the features of Rococo, and then the development of Rococo. Why did it develop? What was happening during the development? <clears throat> we'll look at the beginning of Rococo art, cannot look at the beginning of Rococo art without looking at the Palace of Versailles. The spread of Rococo art uh, to Germany and as well as England. And then we'll look at some more broad Rococo terms uh, with architecture and painting. And actually this is why I do love Rococo art because it had an effect on so many things, including fashion, okay? The dress of the time was so dictated and so fanciful you couldn't get away from it if you were in the upper class. And so we're gonna talk about that. And then we'll look at some last minute um, examples of Rococo architecture in some well-known palaces that are outside of what we would call the norm. So let's go from there. We are now at Rococo art. What is Rococo art? Well, 
Rococo art is a style that developed in the early 1700s, okay? It starts in France. I would say, it, while it does spread, we mainly associate Rococo art with France, okay? When you think about ostentatious, you think about this overly ornate display of wealth, France comes to mind, okay? Yes, it did spread to other places like England and Germany, as I said, but we really don't think about them as being like the epicenter of Rococo art. That's France, right? Rococo art, it is derived from two French terms, and I apologize, I can speak Spanish and Italian. French is not my thing, but I'll try. Uh, the first one is rocaille, or rocaille uh, which means rock work. It's a very common theme. Um, Pebble-like uh, display or the use of rocks in the architecture and art. And coquille, which means shell work. The shell is very, very important into Rococo design. Uh, you can see it in every room of Versailles. Uh, and so these two terms together give us the term Rococo. Uh, it's again, very, very ostentatious. All right? If you're not familiar with that word, it means it is over the top. All right? It takes the lifestyles of the rich and famous, which was a TV show in like the 80s and early 90s, long before you guys were born even before I was born technically, uh, and makes these people look poor, okay? Uh, it is very elaborate, very ornate. Uh, it is very heavily golden with a lot of metal work. Uh, and it's primarily an interior thing. We see it in interior design, on walls. We see it in, we will see it in painting. Um, architecture, it eventually influences some architecture. But again, it's more of an interior part of the architecture, not necessarily the exterior part, as then as we see it in sculpture. Uh, this was known as the art of the nobility. Okay, this is why I call it useless art. Okay, because prior to this time frame, while nobles were the ones who typically bought art because they had the money, it had a purpose, which was to display power, to display wealth. Rococo art does that, but its purpose wasn't anything other than for the enjoyment of the rich. So if I am the king of England and you are the king of France, we are going to try to outdo each other with the Rococo art that we can purchase, rather than trying to get our people to see that we are the ones in charge because we have the money. All right, so this was very much an art style of the nobility. It did not really spread beyond the nobility um, because people couldn't afford it. All right, when we look at the Renaissance, we look at Baroque art, that spread beyond the nobility. Okay, that went on and had an impact on how these people thought on a day-to-day -day basis. Rococo art, not so much, uh, but it is one of my favorite art time periods because of the effect that it had on politics. So features of Rococo art are this idea of undulating curves, which basically means that it looks like waves in water. All right, um, there's no symmetry. That was a big thing in Renaissance art was the idea of symmetry. Uh, Rococo art says, nope, we don't want symmetry. We want things to be fluid and loose. We want it often to look like people can't sit still. They're very restless, right? The colors of Rococo art are also one way you can tell that it's for the very, very rich. All right, I talked about this in my stream about Italian art during the Renaissance, um, as well as in the Northern Renaissance art. Certain colors are incredibly expensive, all right? Certain colors just don't occur naturally, very common in nature. And those are blues and purples. Greens, yellows, browns, and reds are much more common, much easier to make. When you start using pastels, you have upped the, co the cost of a, of a painting to make as well as the price it is to sell. And so that's why we're saying this is the art of the nobility because we've upped the cost even more than we did in the Renaissance time period because we're using light blues, these light pastel greens, these pinks, purples, right? That's one way you can tell how art is changed over time because today you can go to Walmart and you can buy a tube of blue paint for what, three, four bucks? Okay, imagine being in the 1700s and you wanted to paint something blue. You had to grind a stone together, mix it with some other things in order to produce the paint. It's labor intensive, the stone is expensive, and it's not very common. So very, very expensive art. 
The style of the artwork that was used not just in painting, but also in furniture making it was very ornamental. That's what we mean by it's often part of marquetry. Marquetry refers to how you are making wood into a decoration or decorative art of furniture. Beforehand, furniture tended to be just functional. If I had a sofa, it was to sit. If I had a chair, it was to sit. During the Rococo time period, we've changed this now. Now, yes, obviously we want to use the furniture, but we want it to look good as well. So very different from earlier time periods. As I said earlier, it's known for being for the use of the shell, the, the scallop shell. Um, it's very, very common. I'm going to show you some pictures of places that I have visited in Europe where I've seen Rococo art um, so that you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, and with the use of fire, which we oftentimes don't think of fire as being artistic sometimes. We often think of it as more destructive. In Rococo art, fire and flames was meant to be lifelike. So if you see it in a painting, it's supposed to bring to mind to you the warmth of the fire, the heat of the fire for cooking, things like that. And then it's very, very fanciful. Um, Renaissance art is well known for its nudity. Uh, Rococo art is as well, um, but in a more erotic, fanciful way. Okay, and so we're gonna get to that and how that happens as well. So why did this art develop? Well, there's four main reasons this art develops. One is the age of enlightenment, okay? Uh, during this time frame, we are starting to question what is human existence? Why are we here? What are the ideas of natural rights? Uh, what does it mean to be human? Things like that. Um, and people start to have an optimism. They start to feel good about being alive. I remember during the Middle Ages, we're dying of disease, we're dying of being poor and not having food. During the Reformation, we've got massive famine because of the wars. The Enlightenment represents a time frame where all of this is changing, okay? And Baroque art, which was the art time period prior to this, was very dark, it was very heavy, it wasn't very optimistic. So the Age of Enlightenment brings this optimism that people felt we've got to represent in a different way than Baroque art is represented. And so that's one of the reasons why it develops. Uh, then we have uh, the Sun King, Louis XIV, Le Roi Soleil, um, who at the beginnings of his reign, he was very Baroque. He was very much in the Catholic style at that time. Um, but as his reign went on, he had a very, very long reign, uh, he changed and starts to bring in Rococo styles, those curves, the moving water, the natural patterns that we see. Upon his death, though, is where it was going to reach its height. And that is with the Duke of Orléans. Uh, side note for everybody, uh, this is something of like, I don't know, sticky note for me or like my one thing. I know that most of you are not gonna be speaking these terms. And I know that this is a written test, but when you go overseas and you say Orleans, people don't know what you're saying because that's not how you say it. You say Orléans, okay? It's not easy. Sometimes we butcher it. I butcher words all the time. But when you try, you are much more likely to get people to help you and to, you know, appreciate that you've even taken the time to learn how to say something properly rather than just going, I can't do it. I speak English. Move on. Okay. So I digress. Just try to say things properly and move on. So anyways, the Duke of Orléans, he was the regent. That means that the next king was too young. Uh, to take complete power. And so somebody has to rule in his stead until he becomes of age, uh, which generally is 16 to 18, depending upon the time period. Um, and the Duke of Orléans was very much one who um, enjoyed, and we use that term very loosely, the privileges that come along with the power of the Regency. Uh, because money comes along with this, the control of court life, the control of the next king comes along with it. Uh, Louis XIV, his original version or vision of Versailles was to control the nobility. Well, the Duke of Orléans did not like that. So he's moving the nobility away, trying to free up some of their movements uh, and is going to you know, use Rococo art and the Enlightenment to do that. Uh, and then we have Louis XV, um, where Rococo will meet its ultimate height uh, during the 1730s, 
After that, we have some rapid change in European history that causes Rococo to kind of quickly die out. Um, and that's because during Louis XV's time frame, we see a move from architecture and furniture, so very utilitarian, to painting and sculptures uh, and even some music and fashion. So these are some really big developments of why Rococo develops. Um, just remember, Baroque art is very heavy. It's very, very dark sometimes. Rococo art is very light. It's very fluid. It's meant to show change and optimism. So on your left here, we have Louis XIV, Le Roi Soleil, the Sun King. Uh, and you can see that uh, later in life, you can start to see the elements of Rococo in the dress. So he's wearing the wig. Um, he's got the britches with the waistcoat. Um, my students love to point out, ha ha, he's wearing heels. Uh, that was very common to wear heels, uh, men and women. It was just something that's done. It wasn't a masculine feminine thing. Uh, they just did it, okay? Uh, in the middle, you have Philippe II. He was the Duke of Orléans, who was the regent for Louis XV. Um, his art style, again, you still see the Rococo part of it with the wig, as well as the flowy nature of the fabric. But you see his love of power by the way that he's dressing himself from the top up in kind of armor-like material. Um, and he's holding a staff, okay? So he definitely was trying to exert himself as being a powerful man. And then on the right, we have Louis XV. Uh, who was Le Bien Anne, I think is how you say it. He was the good friend or the good king. Um, he was the one who will rule up until right before the American Revolution. Uh, you definitely see the Rococo influence on his painting uh, with the flowing nature of the robes, the heavy, heavy nature, meaning like what the fabric is made of, of the uh, robe, as well as the colors here. It's very light and bright. So Versailles, if you haven't gotten to this part of European history yet, don't worry, you're going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but Versailles was the palace that was built by Louis XIV to control the French nobility. And when we say no expense spared, we mean no expense spared. These are pictures I took when I visited Versailles uh, in 2015. Uh, yeah, 2015. Uh, so on your left, you have the emblem of the Sun King, right? You've got the Sun emblem right there in the middle, uh, but you also see the scallop uh, as well as the flowing nature of the wave type pattern there in the leaves that are coming off of it. The use of gold itself, gold is very bright. Gold makes things airy in their opinion, right? That's some ways you can tell that it's Rococo. Also very, very expensive. You don't touch when you're in the Palace of Versailles. I learned this the hard way. Um, in the middle here, we have a statue of the Sun King uh, dressed as the Roman Emperor and General um, Caesar or Augustus. Behind him, you can see a really good representation of the shell, of the scallop shell, the scallop nature. Um, even within this sculpture, the clothing looks like it's moving. The clothing doesn't look stiff, right? And then this was a painting that I took uh, one of the rooms. I want to say it's the king's bedroom uh, on the ceiling of the room uh, that it's pastel like. And again, you see the flowy nature of the fabric of the characters. You see the movement of the characters. Uh, and it's very happy. It's jovial. It makes one optimistic about what's going on in life. Beautiful place. If you ever get the chance to visit, I highly recommend it. Um, but I will say you can definitely see the ostentatious nature of Rococo art because of the amount of gold that was used. Okay, that's gold leaf, obviously. It's not like heavy, hard gold, but it's still expensive to make. It's a labor intensive process to make gold leaf and then to use it on top of other things. It's an expense that you can see when we get to the French Revolution. Okay, you kind of brought this upon yourself, right? Rococo art will eventually spread from France, uh, from the Palace of Versailles and the Court of Nobles to other areas of Europe. Uh, when it gets into Germany, all right, it initially is going to spread, ironically, 
to the German churches and palaces of the south of Germany. And the reason why I say ironically is because we normally don't associate this style with churches because churches are meant to display the grandeur of God, not the grandeur of the bishop or the cardinal that was placed in that church. Okay? The palaces of the uh, German princes in the south would uh, adopt some Rococo themes, but it is not until Frederick the Great that we see the true adoption of Rococo art uh, in Germany when he builds Sans Souci. Uh, and the way that the influence comes into Germany, it's coming from France, but it's also coming from the Netherlands. The Dutch were big traders during this time period, which means that they're going to go into all these different places, see the artwork, see the architecture, and tell other people about it. And so that's how it's going to spread to Germany. Sans Souci is, in my opinion, actually more beautiful than Versailles. Uh, you can see on the top left, that is a picture of the main building of Sans Souci. Um, and the reason why I say it's more beautiful is it's twofold. One, it's not huge like Versailles. Okay, it's one long building, it's sort of being built up, which to me is more pleasing to the eye. But while there is the use of gold leaf, okay, you can see it in some of these pictures I shared, it's not everywhere. It's not heavy like it is in Versailles. And so for me, Sans Souci is probably a little bit more beautiful than Versailles. Um, but you can, again, you see here the influence of Rococo art. We've got the shell and the wave pattern on the top right. Uh, you've got the movement in the picture of the satyr playing the flute and the, I'm guessing, nymphs, maybe dryads on the right-hand side under the tree, okay? Uh, this sculpture here, this is another example of Rococo art sculpture because we see the movement, the waviness of it, uh, you've got the sun figure uh, in this top, I think this was the grave site, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me, I could be wrong. Um, I just thought it was pretty, it was why I took a picture of it. Um, but that symbol of the sun, the sun means happiness, the sun means, you know, optimism, it's all there. Now, the picture on the bottom right, if you can see, it says 1945. Okay, Sans Souci was or is in Potsdam. Potsdam is a city in Germany. Um, and after, right at the end of World War II, the Americans and the Russians were basically closing in on both sides of Germany. Uh, and 1945 is when Sans Souci was taken back from the Nazis. Uh, and this place was defaced by some soldier. Uh, when I was going through the tour, uh, tour guide, didn't specify who. Um, all he said is that the reason why they did not fix it, because this is pretty destructive to a beautiful piece of marble, okay, that you can see these gold flecks in the stone, uh, that they wanted to use it as a reminder of how destructive absolute power can be. Right. Now, during the Rococo time period, the French king, absolute power. Frederick the Great, absolute power. Right? Maria Theresa, absolute power. And this was a way to show that, yes, we can build these beautiful things. We can make these great designs. But absolute power is absolutely destructive and maybe not a good idea. I thought that was just a really cool thing to see when we were there uh, that, you know, sometimes these things that we have from antiquity or from a couple hundred years ago, they're great to look at, but they represent destruction rather than what we like to think them as. But I digress. So when it spreads to England, Rococo art is very quiet there. Okay, it's not like it is in France where it's ostentatious and in your face. Um, it, it's not very big in England for two reasons. One has to do with the fact that the English in the 1700s are just kind of getting their, full, their hold back on what it means to be a monarchy because they've had the English Civil War where Charles I is killed 
then they had Oliver Cromwell. Um, and then we had the overthrow of James II, the Glorious Revolution. England's had a little bit of upheaval in the 1600s. So in the 1700s, they're still kind of getting their feet wet with this idea of monarchy again. And they're definitely trying to limit the monarchy, unlike in France. And Rococo is expensive. And you've got to be willing to expend the expenditure if you are going to do it. So it's really known as the French taste um, and doesn't take off as well. Where we do see the influences in English Rococo uh, is in silver work, okay? Uh, silversmithing, um, you might have learned or are going to learn in A-Push about Paul Revere. He was a silversmith. He would have known about Rococo style. Okay? That would have been during this time, his time frame as a silversmith, right? It's in porcelain. You can see in this picture up here, the pastel porcelain, the curvature of the porcelain, um, the ornateness of it. Uh, silks, which we're going to talk about when we get to Rococo dress, and then furniture, right? If you look at the legs of this table, between you and me, this table is kind of useless. It's too small. You can't really hold anything uh, other than these five pieces of porcelain on it. And so I like my furniture to be utilitarian, meaning that it has a function and a form. Uh, this is all about form, right? Uh, those legs, meaning that you can't put too heavy of something on it, because if you do, they're going to snap. Um, but at the foot, if you look closely, the leg curls in a whirl, okay? Kind of like it goes like this. Uh, that was very French inspired, okay? Uh, the legs are known as cabriole, uh, which I think is a ballet term, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it refers to looking like the legs are in motion or they're dancing, okay? That's new to English style, right? Remember during the previous time frame, English was very... Not bland, but it wasn't ostentatious. It wasn't in your face. During Cromwell and during Charles II, English furniture was bland and it was very utilitarian because the country was just too poor, right? This will quickly give away, though, to neoclassicism, um, which we will discuss when we get to Napoleon, and romanticism. Both of those art styles come at that same time. Um, and I'm going to stress here, as I've stressed in other streams, remember, uh, we're talking about Rococo art, but at the same time as Rococo art, it's overlapping with Baroque art, okay? Just as Rococo will overlap with neoclassicism. It's not Rococo and neoclassicism and romanticism and, okay? Timelines sit on top of each other, and they overlap. So I hope you can remember that. That's gonna be a really big key to helping you understand all of the events of the 1800s. Rococo architecture, again, I've already stated it began under Louis XIV. Um, it was a reaction of the use of Baroque designs for the structure, okay, so the facade of Versailles. Interior designs of Versailles were Rococo. Okay, and you've got this picture of a sitting room, um, which looks like it threw up Pepto-Bismol, um, somebody likes that, I'm sure. Um, but it was meant to lighten the new residence of the nobles because Versailles was built to house all of the French nobles. Because if the king could keep all of the French nobles there, he could control them. Okay, That's why Versailles was built. It was built to control the French nobles. Rococo architecture and interior designs, it's, again, a preeminence amongst the French upper classes. It does spread to the upper classes of other countries, but it's not as important. And the lower classes, generally, no. It doesn't really have that much impact upon them. You really had to be upper class and really, really rich in order for you to have any kind of influence from Rococo art. Uh, use of mirrors, though, that is something that is new during this time frame. Now, mirrors weren't new themselves, but what was new was that the glass was unblemished. I don't know how many of you live on the East Coast of the United States, uh, but if you go to any of the colonial homes, uh, you can see in the windows, right, that the windows are very thick at the bottom and very thin at the top, um, and oftentimes they're very dirty. It's not that they're necessarily dirty. What it was is that when the glass itself was made, the glass wasn't purified enough to make all of it smooth, 
okay? And so it looks like it's dirty or there's a blemish in it. When you add the reflective material, the coating to make it where it's a mirror, that kind of highlights that blemish. Well, Rococo time period, we're now able to make mirrors that are unblemished, okay? And in Versailles, there's a whole room that's called the Hall of Mirrors. And we're talking that the mirrors go from the floor to the ceiling in a 20, 30 foot room, okay? Very, very, very expensive, but it shows wealth of the nobility only, not of the nation, not of a family, right? Uh, Rococo painting, I generally am not a big fan of painting, and just discussing paintings in general, but I find Rococo paintings refreshing because I find them humorous, okay? Um, re the Rococo painting is going to take its cue from the interior design of Rococo, uh, as well as the shell shape and the rock pattern that started in the architecture of Rococo, okay? Um, Rococo paintings, unlike, again, Baroque or Renaissance paintings, they're purely decorative, okay? A Renaissance painting usually it had some function. It showed Christ, it showed, you know, a noble woman in her marriage, or you know, Baroque art was very much a reaction to the Protestant Reformation, so it was very religious, okay? Rococo painting was art for art's sake, basically, okay? Excuse me? Nope, not gonna sneeze. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's rich man's art. Okay, you and I probably wouldn't be able to afford Rococo art, but that's okay. We can appreciate it in, in museums now. Um, and this is again why I call it useless art because it didn't have that ulterior meaning. It didn't have that ulterior motive. Um, this is me, by the way, saying this, okay? I'm pretty sure there are art people who would watch this and go, oh my God, he's a heretic for calling it useless art. Um, but that's just my opinion, okay? You will see in Rococo art style, the use of curves like you do in the architecture, but also the inclusion of cherubs, okay? Um, cherubs are this idea from this time period that are so interesting to me because when you read about the, them in the Bible, they're not described as being fat little babies, or if you read about them in Greek and Roman mythology, they're not defined as fat little babies. Cherubs are defined usually as just men, and that's about it. But in Rococo art, because we want it to be cute, we want it to be frivolous, cherubs are cute little babies floating around with wings and a diaper. Um, this is where we get the idea of Cupid like that. Okay? Prior to that, Cupid was not a baby. Cupid didn't wear a diaper either. Cupid was a man who was a Greek god. Okay? So we do see a lot of myths of love brought in, whether it's Venus or Aphrodite goddess of love in Roman and Greek mythology. We also see a lot of use of uh, love, lovers from history, or the depiction of lovers amongst the nobility. Very, very bright, very pastel, very delicate colors. Uh, and it, it's just something that it's quite entertaining to see what they would think as risque, because we do see the use of eroticism during this time. Now, not what we would define it, but what they defined as eroticism. So this is an example, two examples of Rococo paintings by one of the masters of Rococo art, Jean-Antoine Watteau, uh, who is considered the beginning or the first master. Uh, on the left, you've got the pilgrimage to Cythera, uh, and on the right, you have his self-portrait. Self-portraitures are still very popular during this time frame. So since the Renaissance, self-portraits are a big thing. Um, and you know, it's something that I thought about and I've seen floating around social media before, but when our, your parents start making fun of you, if you are, you know, saying stop taking selfies, just point out, you aren't the first to do that, right? This man literally embodies a selfie because he painted himself, okay? So selfie culture has been around a lot longer than the cell phone or, uh, and technology. It's been around for a long time. In the painting of Cythera, uh, this is an amor amorous party. Okay, amorous meaning love, um, and you can take from that whatever you would like it to mean. Uh, this was painted after the death of Louis XIV, uh, where, um, and my cat is going to join us. I apologize. Um, let me figure out what he did. 
I'm not sure. Okay, there we go. Can you see that again? You should be able to, okay, you can see it. I apologize. My cat likes to join us sometimes. Um, you know, the death of a king is supposed to be a, a sad time for a country and for people, um, but Rococo art is all about optimism. And so this is, okay, yes, the king is dead, but we have another king, yay! Woo! Um, and it captures that frivolity and sensuousness that Rococo painting is about. The portrait, it's very light, right? Notice it's very, very bright. Yes, he's using a brown, obviously, for his clothing, um, but he's using highlights to it. He's not emphasizing the dark features of it. Okay? Another well-known um, French painter of Rococo art uh, is right here. Now, this is a very rare version of French art, and I am going to butcher her name, so give me a moment to make sure I say it properly, uh, because not often do we discuss French, uh, or excuse me, we do discuss women painters. Uh, Rococo, I am making sure I'm saying it properly for you. Um, I'm going, I just, I'm going to butcher it. Yeah, I'm not going to try to say it because I'm going to butcher it. Plus the cat's trying to change the uh, screen again on me. Uh, so this painter, um, she was very no well known for her portraitures um, and painting the um, queen. Uh, at the time, she was the Princess Marie Antoinette um, in... Uh, the cat that's just trying to take over. Um, so what these portraits show us um, is they show us the light colors of the style of art, okay? The woman's name, last name is, I think it would be Viché Le Brun, um, or, okay, cat, you gotta go, Pat. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's correct. I'll type it in here in the chat so you can look her up. Um, and you can see more of her artwork. Um, but she was very well known for showing women in not exactly flattering positions, okay? Uh, you have a picture of herself. This is a self-portraiture of herself. Um, this low-cut style of her dress right here, that would have been a no-no, <laughs> very much a no-no um, during that time frame because it would have been considered too open, okay? Um, and then you also have, uh, at the time, this was Princess Marie Antoinette, who would eventually become queen. Uh, she was oftentimes painted by Vigée Le Brun, uh, and she was often shown to be overly feminine, okay? You accentuated the breasts, you accentuated the cheeks and the chin of the female form, uh, the blush of the face, things like that. Uh, Vigée Le Brun's uh, landscapes, they were often pastoral, meaning the you know, farm life, um, but not the farm life that you would imagine, you know, cows and animals and things like that. It's farm life of the aristocrats, the rich and famous, meaning they go out, they bring a blanket, they sit down and they watch everybody else do stuff, okay? The most famous, at least to me, the most famous, of the French artists is Jean Honé uh, Fragonard. Uh, Fragonard is also a namesake of a famous French perfumery. Um, so if you ever go to France and you are in uh, Paris, go to Fragonard, you'll get some beautiful uh, perfume. But he is a late Rococo painter. So he's coming at the end of this time period. Um, very hedonistic, okay? Very, very hedonistic. If you look at all of these, all of these paintings show women and men in situations that they really shouldn't be in. Um, you have the swing set right here. And what's so, I don't wanna say great, that's not the right word, but what's so interesting is you have the woman who obviously she is flirting with the guy down here, but she's also flirting with him in a way that was not exactly kosher, right? He's looking up her dress. That's not supposed to be something you do. You have the guy back here who's pulling her on the swing and pushing her on the swing. He's seeing all of this happen and he's not stopping it. Again, not something you're supposed to do. 
Uh, you have the woman up here with her, I'm guessing it's her child and her husband. She's got the um, blindfold on, the colors again, very bright. Uh, you have this woman down here. She's writing a love letter. This is titled The Love Letter. Um, you've got the stolen kiss, right? Women and men were not supposed to touch in public at this time frame. Women and men were definitely not supposed to kiss each other um, if they weren't married at this time frame. And even if you were married, you usually didn't kiss because your teeth were too gross. Uh, and then you have this one right here, which to me is like the epitome of hedonism. Uh, you have the woman who is showing a little bit too much skin. You've got the man who's focusing on her bosom. Um, you know, it's the classic, my eyes are up here. Um, but Fragonard was very prolific in painting these scenes, okay? Painted over 550 of them, probably way more than that, right? That is just paintings. That's not drawings, that's not etchings, all right? Very, very prolific painter. And he painted the lifestyle of the nobility, right? Their daily lives, right? These are things that you would not discuss in public at that time. Uh, he did study under one of the earlier masters of Rococo, Francois Boucher, um, who also was a contemporary of Watteau. The weird thing about Rococo paintings as well as Fragona, is that they were ignored for a long time, right? They weren't really looked at as something that was part of the art history, you know, time period, right? Again, the cat, he likes to join us. I apologize. Uh, where were we? We were here. So it's not until the late 1800s uh, and early 1900s that we see Rococo art um, really get its due diligence um, and it's paid attention to again. And Fragonard himself gains a lot of notoriety from that. So, Rococo dress. Now this is to me the most important part of Rococo because this is politics, okay? Yes, we're talking about clothing, but we're, we're talking about the use of clothing to send messages, okay? Clothing can send a lot of information to people, right? Whether it has words written on it, whether it wants to say i'm open i'm closed wants to say i'm angry i'm sad clothing sends a message and rococo dress definitely sent a message okay it was extravagant you have madame de pompadour who is in the painting right here on the top right um and if you look at that dress that dress is very very big um in the hoop which meant that it probably was not very easy to sit down the way she was in this painting it would have been even harder to get up in the way she was in this painting. Um, but it's very elegant, very elegant. It is all about the look of the dress. It's all about what it says. Um, highly refined, okay? Refined meaning that there's a lot of detail and a lot of decorations. And again, I apologize. The cat just wants to be part of our stream today. Um, so you can say hi, I'm Roku. This is Roku. He likes to say hi to everybody. Um, Anyways, I go back to the stream. So there are new cloths that are used during this time frame. Um, we have calico, um, which is oftentimes you hear referred to as cats, which is the irony of the fact I'm holding one. Um, calico though was a high quality printed cotton. Okay, so it's very high quality, meaning that probably Egyptian at the time, um, it's going to have a very, very soft, high thread count. If you hear about, um, Cotton and thread count. This is one time you would hear about it. All right, goodbye, Roku. Um, you got hair in my mouth. <sighs> you have muslin, which is a very soft cotton gauze. Um, muslin would have been worn underneath, so it would have been what we would call undergarments, or you would say today it would be your uh, underwear or your bra. Um, and then satin. Satin was new at this time frame. Okay, satin was a smoother, um, softer silk um, than what was being produced prior to that. Um, and it would be laid over on top of everything. Okay, that was for women. Men still had their own Rococo dress as well. Um, they would have a coat. Coat would usually be cut roughly around the waist a little bit longer. Um, they would have breeches. Breeches would be cut usually around the knee or mid calf. And then a waistcoat would be on top of that. Um, 
Contrary to its popular name, waistcoats were longer than the waist. They usually went to the thigh. Uh, and this started in the French court. Okay, that's why we know about this so much, because this was one of the abuses of the French monarchy, was the fact that they spent so much money on all of these dresses, right? Uh, and it becomes popular due to people like Madame de Pompadour. Now, you may have heard about this woman, you may not have. You probably have heard about the Pompadour hairstyle, right? It's where you've got the hair and it goes poofy right here, right? Um, was made famous uh, in the 50s in the United States. Um, and then again in the late 70s, early 80s um, with Happy Days. So this style of hair, the reason why it became popular in the 1700s and why she became popular is because she was a incredibly powerful and important mistress to Louis XV. So powerful that she and the queen knew about each other and the queen couldn't do anything about her. Nor did the queen really want to. <laughs> At this time frame, French monarchs were not ever in love matches. They were definitely going to be arranged marriages. And the queen and the king, they did their business, they did their duty, but they didn't like each other. And Madame de Pompadour kept the king away. And so the queen was quite happy with this. It was an arrangement that everybody was happy with. Today, we'd probably be like, what? That's, nope, not allowed. But back then, it's just the way things were done. Uh, queen Marie Antoinette, um, her dress, I mean, she is famous for the amount of dresses that she had made and the intricacy of those dresses. One of the, uh, excuse me, I forgot the word I'm looking for here. One of the resources that I uploaded for you guys, it's a video to A Stitch in Time, which was a web series that's a documentary about clothing from different time periods. And it's the one that's about a painting that I showed you earlier that was Queen Marie Antoinette um, in a very expensive dress because it was made of such light fabric. I highly recommend you watch it. Um, because it also does set up a great way for you to understand why she was so hated by the French with her dress costing what today would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, imagine you paying taxes uh, uh, to support a king and a queen who are buying clothing and you're starving, right? Not a very good mix there. And she's eventually going to lose her head. Okay. Um, the style will eventually spread to other parts of Europe. The emerging bourgeoisie uh, in France are going to imitate the style because they want to have uh, legitimacy amongst the nobility. It will spread to the royal courts of England, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, um, and even makes its way to Russia, okay? The funny thing about the way it makes its way to England, we know that they wore wigs back in that time period. Men often wore wigs, for a lot of different reasons, not just because they were bald like me, um, but because their skin wasn't the best looking, they could have had lice, lots of different reasons. It made its way so ingrained into English society that way that even today, when you are in a court, lawyers and judges still wear the wigs. Right? So we still have this element of Rococo today. And it's not just in England, it's in all of Great Britain. Um, it's here in New Zealand where I live now. They wear it in the courts here as well, in Australia, South Africa, this is like that. Um, opulence was the key here. The more opulent meant the more power you had, it meant the more money you had, it meant the more you could waste that money, okay? We know that there are reports that the hairstyles were feet tall in women. Um, and they were so elaborate and intricately designed with things woven in them uh, that sometimes women would, you know, have to have things to hold it up for them because their own head couldn't hold it up, okay? Um, men's wigs often were powdered to be completely white or off-white, while women, they didn't necessarily use a wig. Their own hair would be powdered gray or blue-gray. Um, so in this picture of Madame de Pompadour, she probably didn't have gray hair at that age, um, but it was powdered that way so that it looked like it. Uh, but here you can see, this is Marie Antoinette. This is an example of her hair um, and how tall it went, right? Uh, the opulence, I mean, this is a diamond crusted jewel 
headpiece thing. I don't even know what the word for it is, brooch, right? The fabric of that satin or silk brocade that's woven in, the jewels of the um, um, hair jewelry, I'm losing words here, I'm not sure, right there, were so important to the style. It goes all the way down into these trusses right here. I would guess that these are pearls. And it also was in the noble boys. This is young Peter, uh, who would eventually take over after Ka um, Catherine the Great, right? Not very long, but he was there. Um, you have again, Madame de Pompadour here. Uh, her hairstyle is demure here. I would say this is probably later in life, um, but this woven jewelry into that hair was probably worth more than you and I will ever see in our lifetime. Uh, this is an example in a museum of what the skirt would look like, the hoop skirt, the hairstyle, uh, would look like. Uh, you can see the layers of clothing, the muslin, the silk, the satin. Um, and then you have Catherine the Great here on the right uh, with her hair done up like the Rococo style. And Catherine the Great was the Tsarina of Russia. So it made its way all through the European courts. Uh, very, very important uh, style at this time frame. I would say that Rococo dress had way more impact on Europe than Rococo paintings and architecture did. Because this is where we see politics happen. This is where the taller your hair, the more power you have. The more ornate your hair, the more ornate your clothing, the more jewels you have, the more sewing into your clothing, the more power and money you have, okay? And again, this becomes one of the key reasons why the French public is going to execute Marie Antoinette. Because she has so many dresses that, cost so much money, right? It, it, it's astounding that one dress could cost that much money because uh, I can't even imagine somebody doing that today. I'm sure there are people do, you know, but it, it's not something that I think we would accept as our political leaders doing it. And so um, Rococo does spread, as I said earlier, um, this is an example of some other places besides Germany that um, I, pictures I visited, uh, you've got here on the left, this is Schönbrunn. Uh, Schönbrunn is in Vienna. It is the palace of the Habsburgs, all right? Um, and the Habsburgs, I like to call them the Kardashians of European monarchies. No one knows how they got to power. No one knows why they stayed in power. All we do know is that they're there and they're the best train wreck to watch, okay? Um, and so you've got the statues here in the gardens at Schönbrunn. Uh, you might see in the background there the eagle uh, that's been made famous from a site when Vienna was taken over by the Nazis and flags are hung from it. Um, these two pictures I took myself when I was in Vienna. Uh, this picture down here on the right, this is actually uh, at Catherine Palace in Sarkoye, Russia. I have not been there, um, but this is where we're saying that the architecture kind of changes a little. You look at the Chambrun and you go back and you look at uh, Sans Souci or Versailles, the architecture outside is very Baroque. It's very one color, monocolor, it's very imposing, right? But if you look here at Catherine Palace, it's very bright, it's very airy, it's beautiful, beautiful shade of blue. And so imagine the amount of money it costs to make that paint. I just can't, like it's so much money. Um, and today, we can't even produce some of these colors anymore because either the stone or the animal that we use to make the colors are, are gone um, and synthetics haven't gotten quite close to the right color yet. So keeping these um, paintings and buildings uh, in pristine condition is of the utmost importance. So that is Rococo art. I hope you enjoyed this stream. I hope you learned a lot about Rococo. Um, this is one of the more entertaining art styles that I like to teach about. Um, and don't forget to follow Fiveable on all the social media. Uh, you can follow me if you want uh, on Twitter at USTeachNNZ. Um, you can follow the other streamers uh, and please come join us on our other streams. We are here to help you guys. Send us your questions, um, ask your questions here in the chat. We are here to answer them. So I do appreciate those of you that are able to join for joining me. Um, and I am glad you enjoyed it, Madonna. Thank you for joining me. So I am hopefully we'll see you guys on Tuesday. You have a wonderful evening and make sure you get some sleep. Kia kaha.